Members, we continue with uh, inaugural speeches and thank you for your attention. I give the call to the Honourable Jackie Jarvis. I start by acknowledging the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet tonight, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and I also acknowledge and recognise the strength, resilience and capacity of the Noongar people across my South West electorate. I pay my respects to their elders past and present. President, I congratulate you on your election as President of the 41st Parliament. I'm incredibly proud to stand here today representing the communities of the South West Electoral Region, where I have lived for almost 25 years. It is in this region that I married Matt and where our daughters Caitlin, Madison and Ashley were born and raised. My journey to this place, however, started in the English town of Bletchley, northwest of London, where my parents had moved in the late 1960s with a dream of buying their first home. That was a big dream for my father, who had grown up in relative poverty on the west coast of Ireland, and for my English mother raised in war-torn South London. Unfortunately, that dream of home ownership in the UK was short-lived. My father, as an unskilled builder's labourer, was part of a casualised migrant workforce whose ability to support his family was impacted by severe winters, snow and even floods shutting down construction projects in that part of England. By 1969, my parents faced repossession of their home and they sought a better life for their two young children. My migrant story is similar to many West Australians and perhaps similar to some in this place. I arrived in Fremantle in April 1970 as a toddler with my older brother, my parents and not much more. My parents lived and breathed the idea of Australia as a lucky country and worked hard to make their own luck. Dad spent decades helping to build this state, from grain receival bins across the wheat belt to mine sites in the goldfields in the northwest. There are few places in WA Dad has not worked. And while Dad was working away for weeks on end, my mum raised two children in suburban Wanneroo, working as a cleaner and a farmhand. My mum and Dad both worked in physically demanding jobs into their 60s, but I can never, ever once remember them complaining about the work they did or the life they had. When they retired to Bussenden in their 70s, they had enough money to buy a modest house, a late model car, and take overseas holidays every few years. They considered themselves the luckiest people in the world for being welcomed to Western Australia. This is a sad bit, and then I'm going to get better. Uh, sadly, my mum died five years ago. Uh, this week is National Palliative Care Week, so it's an apt time to acknowledge the care given to her by the staff and volunteers at the Bustleton Hospice. Um, these days, my dad lives with dementia at the Bustleton Aged Care Facility, where he receives support and care from the hard-working and dedicated staff. Uh, whilst it breaks my heart that my parents are not here to see me today, I'm grateful to have my much-loved big brother Terence here. Growing up half a world away from any extended family, he's an important part of who I am. All right, that's it. I'm not going to cry after this. <laughs> uh, growing up in 1970s, Wanneroo was very much like living in a country town. My mum would do cleaning jobs in the morning and then work on a local vegetable farm in the afternoons. My teenage years saw me working alongside her after school and on weekends, planting cauliflowers, packing celery and harvesting lettuce. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> the family, the farm was owned by an Italian family who had arrived in WA as post-war migrants and we worked alongside Vietnamese refugees who had been engineers and doctors before fleeing their homeland. Swearing to never work in agriculture again, I started work as a bank trainee when I was 16 and built a career in the finance industry. I met my husband, Matt, along the way, and although we had both grown up in Perth, our banking careers led us to the beautiful southwest. After stints in Manjimup, Bunbury, Bustledon, and then back to Perth, Matt was offered a bank manager's job in Margaret River in 1996. Newly engaged, I joined Matt in Margaret River. But the international bank I was then working for in Perth didn't have any country branches for me to transfer to. Instead, I took on the contract to be the cleaner of the bank where Matt was working. Twelve years after leaving school, I left my job as a home loan officer to become a cleaner like my mum. 
It was the first of many casual and seasonal jobs I had in the Margaret River region, reflecting the difficulty in finding full-time permanent work in a regional town dominated by seasonal industries such as agriculture and tourism. In 1997, Matt and I embarked on a crazy plan to plant a vineyard. We sold the home we'd been paying off in Perth, substantially increased our mortgage, and bought a 50-acre paddock that had once been part of a cattle farm just north of Margaret River. Our daughter Caitlin was born in early 1998, and we pushed her along in the pram as we hand-planted the first grapevines that spring. By July 1999, Caitlin had been joined by a sister, Madison, and then another sister, Ashley, in 2004. While our daughters were young, Matt continued to work full time and establish a commercial sized vineyard, while I managed the farm administration and bookkeeping. By 2010, Matt was self employed and I took the opportunity to return to off farm employment. I went back to banking as a small business advisor. It was a job I came to loathe as a pushy sales culture, the offshoring of critical credit assessment jobs and the automatic increasing of overdrafts so operators of failing businesses encouraged to take on more debt without consideration as to how they might repay it. It of course took a Banking Royal Commission many years later to finally shine a light on the practices of Australian banks. So in 2012 I moved into the not-for-profit sector as the WA State Manager of the Harvest Trail Service. The service had started in the late 1990s with the Commonwealth Government paying job service providers to place unemployed Australians into fruit picking and other seasonal horticulture work. The service was originally introduced around 25 years ago to appease those who declared that Australians are too lazy to do this type of work or would prefer to remain on the dole. The reality is much of the work on offer is in sparsely populated regional locations, is highly seasonal and can be unpredictable as the weather dictates employment start dates, hours of work available on any given day, and even periods of being stood down without pay at short notice. The widespread use of peace rates adds to the uncertainty for potential employees considering relocating for this type of work. By the time I joined in 2012, the harvest trail was being used almost exclusively by backpackers, as young people in Australia on working holiday visas were offered visa extensions to do seasonal farm work. I saw, however, many agricultural businesses relying on backpackers to do what should have been full-time year-round work. The mining boom and low unemployment rates saw farm businesses struggle to find local workers. Reflecting on my time working alongside Vietnamese refugees in the 1980s, I designed and delivered a regional migration employment program. The program was delivered in 2013 thanks to a $50,000 grant from the WA Office of Multicultural Interests. This pilot program identified employment opportunities in regional WA and I worked with refugee support organisations to find willing workers. There were a number of short term and seasonal placements but some of those jobs became permanent jobs. When I revisited those farms 18 months later, there were still six young men working in full time farming roles across Australia, Western Australia. All of these young men had been receiving government benefits prior to joining the pilot program. A $50,000 grant in 2013 from the WA government had saved the Commonwealth over $100,000 in welfare payments in the first year alone. As a result of the program, I was honoured to be named as WA's 2014 Rural Woman of the Year and as the national runner-up that same year. So what a great pilot program. Did it get expanded? In a word, no. I simply ran out of available workers. At the time, both major political parties had stopped the boats policies at a federal level. Policies that saw many refugees allowed to stay in Australia but refuse the right to work. I remember a visit to a share house of six Afghan men where I found only one had a work visa. Their individual work rights had been determined by what date they arrived in Australia and which immigration policy applied at that time. While I appreciated and understood the reasoning behind these policy changes, and I do reflect on the, on, at the, reflect on the at sea tragedies we saw at the time, I was still left dismayed by people wanting to work, 
but unable to. We do, of course, have Commonwealth-funded refugee programs bringing new families into WA, but in my experience, WA's small regional population makes it difficult for, re for smaller regional re and regional communities to deliver or access the services needed for successful, successful migration programs. My parents arrived in Australia in 1970 as unskilled migrants, yet they made a valuable contribution to Australia, working in critical construction and food production jobs. Both my brother and I were in full-time work by the age of 16. We too have made worthwhile contributions to this country as taxpayers, small business owners, employers and community members. Our adult children, the first-born Australians in our family, carry on the migrant work ethic of their grandparents, work, all working in professional careers or trades. Yet despite this, a family like mine could not, would not be able to migrate to Australia in later decades. Since the 1980s, Australia's immigration policies have moved towards skilled migration on the basis that this would lead to better labour market outcomes and see new migrants able to gain employment and achieve economic independence sooner. While all of this is true, I am concerned that an increasing focus on skilled migration over many decades has created a two-tiered migration system with skilled migrants afforded some level of industrial relations protection that comes from being part of a sanctioned migration program, and a more vulnerable cohort, cohort of unskilled or low-skilled workers who are in Australia as backpackers and international students. Now, in theory, all workers in Australia are protected by industrial relations law, but in practice, people on working holiday and student visas are often more vulnerable to underpayment or, explo or exploitation. Backpackers and international students have become the mainstay of seasonal agricultural, hospitality and tourism jobs in the regions and as gig economy workers in our cities. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the flaw in building an economy that relies too heavily on having a revolving pool, sorry, a revolving pool of international workers on short-term visas. We have an amazing education system here in WA with pathways to training, trades and tertiary education. I'm proud to be part of a re-elected McGowan government that has a jobs plan and a commitment to diversify WA's economy. Local companies and workers will be prioritised when it comes to state government infrastructure and services, and the WA by local policy will prioritise regional businesses like those in my electorate. One of the things I love most about the South West is the willingness of local businesses to take on local, young local workers. All of my daughters and most of their friends work part-time while at school for various cafes and tourism businesses. But to ensure regional employers can utilise WA's most important resource, our people, we need to break down the conventional wisdom that all roads lead to Perth for country kids. Only around half of the Year 12 students that graduate in WA every year have chosen a university entrance pathway. The other half have completed vocational certificate and general education courses. No matter what pathway these school leavers are on, we need to engage, encourage and provide opportunities for more young people to take up trade apprenticeships, skills-based traineeships and graduate roles in the South West and indeed across all of our regions. And we need employers recognising that all, not all young people want to leave their region. I mean, why would anyone want to leave the South West? Despite the work ethic of the young people I see every day, I have been told many times over the years that young Australians don't want to work in particular industries. A friend recently told me about her father, an older broadacre farmer who often cited the unwillingness of young Australians to work in agriculture. For many years, he would recruit New Zealand workers for the annual grain harvest, citing their, their skill and their work ethic. One year, this farmer went on a trip to New Zealand. When talking to local farmers, he was amazed to hear his New Zealand hosts say that they only ever employed Australians for, New for the New Zealand harvest because the local New Zealanders were just too lazy to do farming work. It's all about perspective. I reflect now on my journey into politics. 
My parents were Labor voters and members of a union, but not actively involved in these organisations. As a young woman, I greatly admired our local Member of Parliament, Jackie Watkins, the member for Joondalup and then Wanneroo. Despite sharing a name and a common background as an English migrant, it never occurred, occurred to me that I too could be a Member of Parliament. My parents had arrived in Australia under the Assisted Passage Scheme, or to use a common vernacular, as £10 POMs. Whilst my mum was English, my dad was born in Ireland, but born before the establishment of the Republic of Ireland, and so was classified as a British subject. As a result, both of my parents could vote in Australian elections from the day they arrived. In 1984, the law changed and only Australian citizens could enrol to vote. But an exemption, exception was made for British subjects already on the electoral roll. I didn't turn 18 until 1986. And although we had lived in Australia since 1970, we had not become Australian citizens because my father refused to swear allegiance to an English monarch. So while the Australian and British governments considered my dad a British subject, he certainly did not. I had been a permanent resident of Australia since I was 18 months old. I was born in England and I held a British passport, but I would still need to swear allegiance to the Queen to become an Australian citizen. With mum and dad's blessing, I became an Australian citizen in 1989 and enrolled to vote immediately. In February 1993, I went to a polling booth in Como to vote in the WA state election, only to find there was no Labor candidate running in the South Perth electorate. I was disappointed after all my efforts to enrol to vote. I was disappointed that the place where I lived, my Labor vote didn't seem to count for anything. Just five weeks later, I was back at the polling booth voting the 1993 federal election. This time I had the opportunity to vote for my local Labor MP, the Honourable Kim Beasley, member for Swan. A man I met for the first time yesterday, now His Excellency the Governor of Western Australia. That election returned the Keating Labor government despite polls predicting they would lose. I still vividly remember Keating's True Believer speech later that night and I was proud to know I had played a part. My parents did become Australian citizens in 1994, when the Keating government replaced the oath to the Queen with a pledge of commitment to Australia. My move to the South West in 1996 meant that I was seemingly destined to be voting in safe Conservative held seats at every election. I still can't remember the exact reason why, but in 2005, I decided to join the local branch of the Labor Party. I had three young children, and I suspect I simply wanted to get out of the house. <laughs> I was welcomed to the VAS branch by local Labor stalwarts Ross Brommel and Rod Clark, and South West MLC, the Honourable Adele Farina. There was also an entertaining collective of much older gentlemen who called each other comrade, and told wonderful stories from their decades of involvement in the Labor Party. Within weeks, I was asked to be the vice president of the branch, and I declined, only to be told, no, you have to be. The Labor Party had very clear affirmative action policy that meant, as one of the few female members of the branch, and from memory, the only one to attend the AGM, I needed to take on an executive role. I was certainly capable of taking on this role, but as a mother of three young children and having been out of the, a professional work environment for a number of years, I doubt I would have had the confidence to do so unless pushed. At the time, I was unsure about how I felt about gender quotas. But as I look around the Labor caucus room today, I am indeed a true believer in Labor's affirmative action policies. In 2010, I was the Labor candidate for the federal seat of Forest. I was never expected to win, but remembering the 1993 state election where there was no Labor candidate, I was determined to work hard for local voters. The Honourable Adele Farina was my equally hard-working campaign manager, and WA Labor's then Assistant State Secretary, Cassie Rowe, now the member for Belmont, made regular trips south to assist. Adele and Cassie taught me different but equally valuable lessons in political campaigning. My children were still in primary school at the time, and I remember telling them, that although I didn't win the election, I did come second. <laughs> I 
decided that whilst I enjoyed input into public policy formation, I was not destined to be a politician. I was a Labor Party supporter, but not interested in leaving the Margaret River region. And clearly, the state electorates of Warren Blackwood and Vass could never be winnable seats for Labor. Instead, I built a career in public policy. I joined the public sector and even had a stint in a minister's office. I made lifelong friends who taught me what it means to be a public policy professional and gave me a small insight into how this place works. The Honourable Adele Farina, oh, sorry, well, I'll go back, sorry. The Honourable Alana McTiernan also taught me much. And whilst I doubt that I will ever be able to match her intelligence or her intensity, I am so proud to have her as a colleague in this place. I am also thrilled to be joining her and the Honourable Sally Talbot representing the South West. To have not one, but two experienced and dedicated members by my side is more than I could have hoped for. I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge retiring MLC, the Honourable Adele Farina, who served the South West region for over 20 years. Her recent valedictory speech outlined just a fraction of the things she achieved in the region, and I want to thank her for her service. Over the last couple of years, I've returned to grassroots policy work, first as the CEO of WA's Rural Regional Remote Women's Network, and then back to the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. When the opportunity arose late last year to be a candidate in the 2021 election, I did not expect to be elected. But again, I made a commitment to work hard and give the voters of the South West a viable alternative to the status quo. All of the candidates in our South West region worked incredibly hard, but I had agreed that I would focus on the electorates of Vass and Warren Blackwood. For the record, I, I live in the electorate of Vass, uh, but within about two kilometres of the electorate of Warren Blackwood. I'm pretty well smack bang in the middle. I could not be prouder of the campaigns we ran in those electorates. Chris Hosson was an outstanding candidate for Vass, who ran an intense campaign, putting his life and career on hold to contest the seat. Chris, together with his parents, Steve and Barb Hosson, were able to rally dozens of volunteers. That is no easy task in an electorate that has never been held by the Labor Party. And when I say never, I mean since WA's first election in 1890. Their hard work ensured, every, they, their hard work ensured early polling centres in Bustleton and Dunsborough had Labor representatives present every day for the two and a half weeks of pre-polling for both local voters, but also the many absentee voters holidaying down south. While a swing of 10% would have seen a Labor victory in many seats, it was not enough to get Chris over the line. I want to thank and acknowledge him and the team of volunteers in VAS for this amazing effort. And then there is a seat of Warren Blackwood. Jane Kelsby proved to be another outstanding candidate. We had a two-term strategy, and never in our wildest dreams did we think WA Labor would win in 2021. Jane's hard work and natural affinity for grassroots campaigning paid off, resulting in being just 22 votes behind the sitting member after counting her first preference votes, and then winning the seat by 637 votes after the distribution of preferences. I echo Jane's words on her recent first speech in acknowledging and thanking the hardworking volunteers across the Warren Blackwood electorate. Thank you to Ellie Whitaker from WA Labor Party office and the campaign team at WA Labor for their support and guidance. And special thanks to WA Labor State Party President Carolyn Smith for your faith in me. And I will end tonight with the most important acknowledgements. My husband Matt worked hard to build a vision of a future he wanted for our family. He worked hard to become a successful farmer and winemaker he is today. I am grateful to have been part of building that vision. We share parenting duties equally over the years, swapping primary carer roles as we needed to. And I'm so grateful to be able to share my career successes with him. Our three daughters are, of course, our greatest achievement. Caitlin, Madison and Ashley. 
Thank you for your help on polling day, for not being too embarrassed by me, and for just being wonderful human beings. I close tonight by thanking all of you, my new colleagues, some are old friends and some are new friends, and I also want to acknowledge uh, the newly elected uh, members of the South West who have come from a very diverse background, and I look forward to working with you all. President, thank you. Congratulations and thank you, Honourable Member.